Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for coming out. We really appreciate it. Uh, I was delighted to be able to uh, talk to Dr. Lester Grinspoon about his magnificent, groundbreaking scientific approach uh, to a term that we've heard a lot about, the demon drug, marijuana, the killer weed. Uh, is it a weed? Is it a plant? How old is it? You can go back more than 6,000 years and find evidence that it was in existence. It wasn't looked at as a devil plant or killer weed or a gateway drug then. It was part of the pharmaceuticals. It was part of uh, what people used as a natural uh, type of remedy for different situations. There are a number of significant dates when you look back at uh, Dr. Grinspoon's research and what actually happened and when and where and who caused what to happen. Uh, some of the interesting things, uh, you can go back 6,000 6, years, 150,000 years, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You can find mentions of cannabis uh, in the Bible. Uh, you can find mentions of the types of orna or ornaments, ointment rather, that was used uh, for medicinal purposes. You can uh, learn how the Muslims uh, used it because they couldn't drink alcohol. So this was the substitute and uh, some of the creative uses that have happened around this uh, particular plant. Uh, some people call it a weed. We'll hear from Dr. Grinspoon in terms of how, what category he thinks it should be in. Uh, in the Jewish faith, in the Talmud, you'll find mention of this particular drug. 1492, Columbus did more than sail the ocean blue. He brought something over with him. It was a cannabis plant. And as you probably know, the history of cannabis and all of the different uses just that there are. The Constitution, for instance, uh, was written on paper produced out of cannabis. Most of the lines or housers and the sails and some of the clothing used by the men who uh, were the sailors aboard the United States Constitution and many other ships of the line and merchant ships of the day, uh, cannabis was right in there. It's kind of like this miracle thing that you can use for almost anything. You can squeeze it and get the oil out of it and burn it for fuel. You can make ethanol. Henry Ford, for instance, uh, one of his first cars, one of his first Model A's, uh, he used a cannabis-based plastic formula in that car and then created ethanol, cannabis-based ethanol, for one of the early Model T's. Uh, Dr. Grinspoon will talk about some significant dates when the attitudes began to change around it, when the demonization happened, and what led him to his first book about marijuana, and what led to his second or later works about marijuana reconsidered. Uh, he has been a brilliant scholar of uh, many things, but he's been wrong a couple of times too. Because a couple of times in his books, he predicted that marijuana would be legalized within 10 years. Then he wrote a book called, Oh, Marijuana Revisited. <laughs> you know, I, I think I've got to go back over this again. But he's been very dogged in his research. And some of the people that he's met along the way and the usage, and the, I think the history is the most important thing that we have to look at in terms of the value of what is this that we're talking about? What are the current social feelings about it? What's the legislative thing that's going to happen? So for tonight's program, we also always want to thank our good friends at Cable. We thank you very much for being a part and bringing this to the living rooms for people who couldn't make it because of the snow and parking situation. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce with great pleasure Dr. Lester Grinspoon, Harvard University. Please give him a big round of applause. Thank you, Murray. Yep. Well, one of the pleasures of being here tonight was meeting Maurice, where he interviewed me on the radio uh, some time ago, and uh, he was, uh, he's the kind of guy you like to be interviewed. He knows what he's, uh, he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> now, you may ask, uh, how did a, um, a, someone who was on a fast track at Harvard past tenure track, get involved with marijuana. <laughs> um, I, uh, in the 60s, um, I was uh, this young instructor at Harvard Medical School, 
And I looked out my window at the 60s and I thought, boy, all these young people using this terribly dangerous drug, marijuana. And of course, I was a physician. I knew, I knew about drugs. And uh, um, I also had a best friend who used it daily, and uh, I would warn him about it. And uh, he would say, oh, Lester, here, have a drag. <laughs> he dismissed it. Um, so finally, when uh, I, I was about to start uh, uh, publish uh, what was really my first book, it was on schizophrenia. Um, and I had two junior authors, and one of them was going to be two months late. For, I was to put the whole manuscript together, and Williams and Wilkins, we had a date for them. I had to call them and tell them it was going to be two, two months late, but it gave me some time I hadn't planned for. So I decided I'm going to go in to the, the Countway, is the, uh, the Harvard Medical School Library. I'm going to go into that library and see if I can concisely state the scientific basis for this prohibition, which at that time, this was 1967, at that time we in the United States were arresting 300,000 people, 90% of them uh, for mere possession, most of them, uh, particularly the possession people, not the, the people who were selling it, were very young and criminalizing them. You know, this this can really affect somebody's career. Um, so I went over to the, um, to the library and I started my work there. And um, I soon had my marijuana epiphany. I discovered that despite my training in medicine and science, I had been brainwashed like just about every other citizen in this country about this drug. And so I, I want to tell you a little bit about this, but I'm going to emphasize the medicine now. Please understand that uh, I've been doing this since 67, and uh, I, I've done other things. I've written about other uh, drugs along the way, of course, but my first love has always been marijuana because it's such an interesting drug. It's such a non-toxic drug. And I was fascinated. How did it come about that people have this this notion about this drug. Um, so uh, I went to work in the library. This paper, I hoped it would be published in something that it would be accessible to young people. It was published as the uh, lead paper in, uh, in um, December, uh, December of 1969, the lead paper in uh, Scientific American. And with that, there was a lot of interest. The people from Harvard Press came over and asked me if I'd do a book. First I said no, uh, but then I thought, well, you know, I'm so fascinated by this drug. Uh, this would give me an opportunity to spend more time learning about it, so I agreed to do it. And that's how that came about. At any rate, every age has its peculiar folly. And if Charles McKay, the author of the mid-19th century classic Extraordinary Popular Delusions in the Madness of Crowds, were alive today, he would surely see what I call cannabinophobia. Cannabis is the Latin name for cannabophobia as a popular delusion, along with the tulip mania of 17th century Flanders, some of you may, or the, uh, the uh, uh, witch hunts of an earlier age. Uh, he would surely see this as one example of this. I believe that we are now at the cusp of this particular popular delusion, which to date has been responsible for the arrest of over 20 million Americans. The arrest, not to speak of the criminalization, uh, uh, you know, making a criminal out of those who wish to use this drug. I also believe that future historians will look at this epic and recognize, recognize it as, well, I said that, the madness of crowds. Millions of marijuana users have already arrived at this understanding, and for a short period of time in the 70s, it was possible to believe that this popular delusion was beginning to lose its deeply embedded grip. Whatever the cultural conditions that made it possible, there was no doubt that the discussion about marijuana was becoming more sensible. 
we were gradually becoming conscious of the irrationality of classifying this drug as one with a high potential for abuse and no medical value. It seemed to me that if the trend had continued, it was likely that within a decade at that time, marijuana would be sold and regulated in the United States, much in the same way as alcohol. We had reason, reason to be optimistic at that time. In 1971, the National Commission on Marijuana and Drug Abuse, the Schaefer Commission, also known by that name, but appointed by President Nixon, had recommended the elimination of penalties for possession of marijuana for personal and casual nonprofit transfers of small amounts. In 1973, Oregon had become the first state to decriminalize marijuana, making possession of less than an ounce a civil offense, a penalized by a small fine. In 1975, Alaska had eliminated all penalties for private possession and cultivation of less than four ounces. President Carter had endorsed decriminalization, as had the American Medical Association, the American Psychiatric Association, the American Bar Association, the National Councils of Churches, etc. By, 19, nine, uh, by 1977, most states had reduced simple possession to a misdemeanor. It had been a felony. And in 1980, 11 states actually decriminalized possession. Unfortunately, this trend did not continue. The marijuana reform movement peaked in the early 70s. In 1978, Dr. Peter Bourne, the White House drug advisor who had helped President Carter move towards reform, resigned and was replaced by Lee Dogoloff, who was a real hardliner. In the same year, the proportion of the population favoring legalization began to fall from its 1977 high of 28%. Under President Reagan, the government instituted a program of zero tolerance. By 1983, it was spraying the dangerous insecticide Paraquat on domestic marijuana crops and using also Mexican marijuana crops, also using military methods to un uproot cannabis plants and arrest growers in Northern California, particularly Mendocino County. In 1987, Supreme Court uh, nominee Douglas, Douglas uh, Ginsburg had to withdraw under pressure because he admitted to using smoke marijuana as a law professor. In 1980, let me tell you, if that were true today, Harvard Law School would be empty. <laughs> but that's another matter. <laughs> in, in, in 1989, under, pressure, uh, under President George D.W. Bush, the federal government began Operation Green Merchant. It confiscated lists of people who had ordered indoor plant growing equipment and raided, they got hold of these lists, your name was on the list, they would go and raid your home. It was worse than that. They, would, they had the legal right to confiscate anything that Mara, they could confiscate homes they did, automobiles, airplanes, yachts, the first Bush administration also worked hard to persuade Alaska to recriminalize re marijuana possession and actually succeeded in 1990. That same year, Congress passed a bill calling for federal transportation funds to be withheld from states refusing a six-month suspension of the automobile licenses of people convicted of marijuana possession. It is important to remember that these increasingly harsh government measures and the growing hysteria of anti-marijuana citizens group, like uh, Drug Free America, etc., did not reflect any new knowledge about the dangers of the drug. The more than four decades since the publication of the first edition of Marijuana Reconsidered, that was in 1971, those four decades have produced remarkably little clinical, sociological, epidemiological, or epidemiological evidence of serious health or social problems caused by marijuana. The present attitude of the government and anti-marijuana crusaders bears the same relationship to reality that the film Reefa Madness 
Gore in 1936. Have any of you here seen the movie Reef of Madness? Then there's one person here who knows what. <laughs> you have to, too. <laughs> It, well, it used to be seen as an important, it was a documentary of what marijuana did now, of course. It's, it's laughable, uh, you know, rape, violence, I mean, all sorts of things. Um, but the dissonance is even more striking now because we know so much more. Since 1971, many millions of dollars have been spent by the National Institute of Drug Abuse to study the dangers of cannabis. And this vast research enterprise has completely failed to provide a scientific basis for the prohibition. In fact, you know, when I, when I feel confident, I feel confident about saying that this is among the safest drugs on the planet. Uh, part of the reason is because it's the most studied drug on the planet. Uh, Nothing has received it, and it's all come up with a goose egg. There's never been a death anywhere in the world from it, to, to, to take the most extreme form of toxicity. Although evidence against the toxicity continued to accumulate, the government persists in escalating its war on marijuana users, most cruelly on those who use it for medicinal purposes. To justify, <coughs> to justify this policy, usually with the Drug Enforcement Administration as its voice, it, it distorts, stretches, truncates, uh, and in other, ways, in other ways dissimulates the findings to an extent worthy of Procrustes. In 1971, I pointed out in Marijuana Reconsidered that since cannabis had been used by so many people, all over the world for thousands of years and for, with so little evidence of significant toxic effects, the discovery of some previously unknown serious health hazard was unlikely. I suggested that the emphasis in cannabis research should be shifted to its potential both as a medicine and as a tool to advance our understanding of brain function. Although few government resources have been committed to either of these fields, there have been compelling developments in both. In 1990, researchers discovered that the first, discovered the first of two receptors in the brain stimulated by THC. Now, what is a receptor? Let me just start. On the in the brain cells, the way communication happens is here is one cell, it has to communicate with this cell. And, and this is a, a, this, the space between is called the synapse. There are uh, these chemicals uh, that, like you've heard of serotonin and dopamine and so forth. It's now clear that there, these people discovered in 1990 the first of so far two of these neurotransmitters that stimulate uh, they discovered the first uh, receptor site, and if there's a receptor site for a cannabis-like molecule, see the neurotransmitter is the key that triggers. It fits in. The, it'll only fit in a certain, and it triggers that nerve to discharge. The uh, the uh, it, it was predicted when they were discovered that there must be neurotransmitters. I mean, nature didn't build receptor sites in so many parts of the brain. It isn't like opium. It's all in the brain stem, all over the brain. Um, and sure enough, uh, the, uh, uh, the first of two transmitters, neurotransmitters, was discovered two years later. And the, uh, the, uh, it was discovered in Israel, and they named it Ananda after the... Uh, the Sanskrit word for, for bliss. They named it Ananda, uh, Ananda Mine after the Sanskrit word Ananda for, for bliss. Um, now, as I hinted at, ca cannabinoid receptor sites occur not only in the lower brain, but in the cerebral cortex, which governs, governs higher thinking. These discoveries raise some interesting questions. Could the distribution of Ananda Mine anandamide receptor sites in the higher brain explain why so many marijuana users 
claims that the drug enhances some mental activities, including creativity and fluidity of associations. Do these receptor sites play a role in marijuana's capacity to alter the subjective experience of time? Do, <coughs> what, <coughs> excuse me, what about the subtle enhancement of perception and the capacity to experience the physical world with some of the freshness, freshness and excitement of childhood? Today, there is a large research enterprise focusing on what is now called the endocannabinoid system, like the dopamine system or what have you, which continues to promote a better understanding of the remarkably diverse versatility of cannabis as a medicine, a recreational drug, and an enhancer. Despite the conditions that, uh, despite conditions that deter medical researchers, medical applications of cannabis have been considerable since 1971. Now, in Marijuana Reconsidered, I, re I was able to find that since uh, there's a long history, as, uh, as uh, has been indicated uh, by Mr. Lewis, there's a long history of cannabis as a medicine. Uh, the first known uh, pharmacopoeia, so to speak, was that of the Chinese Emperor Chen Nung, who lived 5,000 years ago. Uh, and it's been used, you find not very extensive citation. There isn't much you can do with that literature. It made its debut in Western medicine in um, 1848 when a man by the name of W.B. O'Shaughnessy, a British man working in Calcutta, seeing what the indigenous people did, uh, how they used it, he uh, tested it on, on animals, found to be, to be non-toxic, and then gave it to people with, uh, as the Indians did, who suffered from things like rabies and tetanus and epilepsy. He was particularly interested in the convulsive disorders and found that it was remarkably useful. I mean, these were in the days of before, well before Dilantin or any other drug. So it was, and that began the interest in this substance in the la in the latter part of the 19th century. In fact, in the Conway Library, I was able to identify 100 papers that have been published between 1852 and 1900 on marijuana, on cannabis as medicine. Despite conditions that deter medical research, uh, medical applications of cannabis, as I said, have seen uh, uh, considerable progress since 71 under the most unusual and difficult circumstances. Now, new drugs, that is, new medicinal drugs, are generally shepherded over the complicated federal regulatory obstacle course by pharmaceutical companies, which, deva which devote vast researches to the task of taking a chemical with putative therapeutic potential and transforming it into a marketable property. That is to say, to get through the FDA, get a drug through the FDA, you have to first do the animal studies that prove its safety, and then you have to start doing the, uh, the phase three and phase four, the, the clinical tests to be sure it's safe in people, and it is efficacious. Not, not just safe, but efficacious. However, uh, we should note that the patent protection, with patent protection, it is impossible for a plant to be patented, and no drug company is ever likely to undertake this effort on behalf of marijuana. You know, we talk about marijuana as a medicine, but it's not going to be something you can buy at your drugstore, FDA approved. Even now, I mean, the gov our government now says, uncategorically, marijuana is not a medicine. It has no medical utility. This is the official position of the U.S. government at a time when Arizona just became the 16th state to legalize marijuana and the District of Columbia. And eight other states are now working on what such, including Massachusetts. Now, a synthetic THC developed by a pharmaceutical company was called dronabinol, or the uh, proprietary name is Marinol. Uh, 
the federal authorities had come to believe that its availability would quell demands from people like me that marijuana be available to patients as a medicine. It was made, and this illustrates the hypocrisy of the government here. I hate to be coming down so hard on the government, but on this issue. <laughs> um, marijuana, cannabis, was placed in when the uh, Controlled Substance Abuse Act was enacted by Congress in 1970. It divided all psychoactive drugs into five categories. Category one, the most severe. Nobody could use those drugs. You couldn't even do research. If it was in category one, it was out. LSD, heroin, marijuana were the three drugs that were in it. But in 1985, when the government wanted people to say, no, there is a, a marijuana drug now. You can buy dronabin, or you can buy melorel as the, um, um, marinol as the, uh, the type of product. Even though marinol is the same 21 carbon molecule that THC is. They're identical. But the government decided to put it in Schedule II because a physician can prescribe a medicine in, in Schedule II. Um, and there was another instance of hypocrisy when the government actually started a program. Uh, so much pressure was brought on people that began a, a program called the Compassionate IND program where you could get, if you could get the government permission, and it took the average person and doctor making out wings almost two years to get it. Most of the time, it was terrible. And all that time, until it was discontinued in 1991, and finally in 92, only about two dozen people ever got these things. And hundreds and hundreds applied for them. There were three of those, three, four of those people still alive. They get a tin this big, from the government of the marijuana grown on the only marijuana farm in the United States, the government farm in Oxford, Mississippi, and they get their month's supply in this, this little tin. So the government, out of one side of its mouth, says, it isn't a medicine. On the other side, it's giving this medicine to the three who survive and hope they don't talk too much. They talk a lot, though. <laughs> <laughs> the effort to make herbal marijuana available, available as a prescription drug was initiated in 1970 by the International Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, normal as it's called. And it worked its way through the legal system with excruciating slowness. Early in this judicial process, the DEA was told to conduct studies on this, the, to hold hearings and question uh, experts on it. It wasn't until 1986 at 14 years later, that they finally, the pressure was became, that the DEA uh, started to uh, have the hearings. In 1986, the administrator of the DEA finally announced that he would hold public hearings ordered by the courts. Those hearings, which began in 86, lasted two years. Hearings in, on the West Coast, in the Midwest, and on the East Coast, many uh, experts on this, many patients, uh, before uh, judge, the DEA administrative judge, uh, Francis L. Young. He reviewed the evidence, which amounted to thousands of pages, and rendered his decision in 1988. Young said that approval by a significant minority of, because in the DEA rules, uh, what are the reasons they gave for, for not allowing cannabis to med? Because there is not a significant number of physicians who believe it is. He, he said there is a significant minority of physicians, and it was big enough to meet the standard of currently accepted medical use in the treatment in the United States, established by the Controlled Substances Act, which I've already mentioned. He added that marijuana in its natural form I'm quoting him, marijuana in its natural form is one of the safest therapeutic, therapeutically active substances known to man. One must reasonably conclude that there is accept, accepted safety 
for use of marijuana under medical supervision. To conclude otherwise, on the record, would be unreasonable, arbitrary, and capricious. Young went on to recommend to the administrator of the DEA uh, that he conclude that the marijuana plant was considered, plant considered as a whole has a currently accepted medical use in treatment in the United States and that there is no lack of accepted safety for use under its medical supervision and that it may be lawfully transferred from Schedule 1 to Schedule 2. The DEA disregarded the opinion of its own administrative law judge and refused to reschedule marijuana. That is, it's still in Schedule 1. DE Administrator John Lawn, he was the administrator at that time, went further, calling claims for the medical utility of marijuana, quote, a dangerous and cruel hoax. In the last 25 years, as the medical potential for cannabis has become increasingly clear, I have witnessed the growing frustration of patients who cannot obtain it legally. The United States government must accept responsibility for the unnecessary suffering produced by a policy that can only be described as ignorant and cruel, and for forcing its citizens to engage in criminal activity. Despite government obstructionism, many patients have learned to use marijuana therapeutically, and many more are discovering its benefits. When I first considered this issue in the early 1970s, I assumed that cannabis as medicine would be identical to the marijuana that is used for other purposes, namely the dried flowering tops of female cannabis sativa plants. Toxicity is minimal, dosage is easily titrated, and once freed of the prohibition tariff, it will be inexpensive. I thought the main problem was its classification in Schedule 1, uh, and Schedule 1 describes the, the medicines in that as having a high potential for abuse, no accepted medical use, and an inability to use it safely, even under the supervision of a doctor. At that time, I na naively believed that a change to Schedule 2 would overcome a major obstacle to its legal availability as a medicine. I had already come to believe that the greatest harm in recreational use of marijuana came not from any inherent property of the drug itself, but because of the effects of the prohibition, arresting all these young people and so forth. But I saw that as, I saw that as a separate issue. I believed then that like opiates and cocaine, cannabis, cannabis could be used medically while remaining outlawed for other purposes. I thought that once it was transferred to Schedule II, clinical research of marijuana would be pursued eagerly. It couldn't be pursued before you. Even now, there was just a report that's come out that says there are only 19 instances where the DEA, if you're going to do research on marijuana, you have to get not, you have to go not just through the FDA, you have to go through the DEA. And they've approved only 19 of all the hundreds of people who are trying to do the research on this, only 19, well, two of them have already passed, the work of Dr. Donald Abrams in San Francisco. Um, I saw this as a separate issue. I believe that, like I said, it could be used medically while these other drugs, Schedule I drugs, were prohibited. I thought that, uh, that once it was transferred to two, we'd have clear sailing. We'd be able, it, turned out to be not true. Uh, a quarter of a century later, I began to doubt this. I would, it, it would be highly desirable if marijuana could be approved as a legitimate medicine within the present federal regulatory system, but it now seems highly unlikely. Today, transferring marijuana to Schedule II, uh, which ha still has a high criteria, high potential for abuse, but it has some limited medical use. That's what we are trying to get, so at least we could do research. Uh, would not be enough, transferring it to two would not be enough to make it available as a prescription drug. Such drugs must undergo rigorous, expensive, and time-consuming tests before they are approved by the FDA. 
The system is designed to regulate commercial distribution of drug company products and protect the public against false or misleading claims about their efficacy and safety. The drug is generally a single synthetic chemical that a pharmaceutical company has developed and patented. The company submits an application to the FDA and tests it for safety in animals and then for clinical safety and efficacy. The company must present evidence from double-blind control studies showing that the drug is more effective than a placebo and at least as effective as the best available drug for the treatment of that particular symptom. The cost of this evaluation exceeds $200 million. Some have gone as high as $800 million. Case reports, expert opinion, and clinical experience are not considered sufficient. I now have doubts that it is possible to develop herbal marijuana as an officially recognized medicine via this route. Also, uh, what would the price of the, this uh, pharmaceutical marijuana have to, wouldn't it have to be controlled? Because if it's too high, the patients would buy it on the street. If it costs more to get the medicine, the official medicine, they'd go on the, or they'd, uh, they'd start growing it in their own homes. Indoors, you can grow it in a closet. Um, if it's too low, uh, everybody would have, oh, doctor, I've got a bad back and I need <laughs> marijuana. <laughs> uh, what about the parallel problems with potency? Uh, there are problems with being too potent and not potent enough. And when urine tests are ordered for, for you because you work for some company that demands it, how are we going to know that you're using it for medical reasons or just to have fun? <laughs> Mustn't do that. <laughs> if the full potential of, of, a of marijuana as a medicine were to be achieved in the setting of the present prohibition system, all of these problems and more would have to be addressed. It does. But it, it depends on who the federal people are in that particular area. For, in, for example, in San Francisco, uh, there was a district attorney who was very close to the uh, federal attorney, and he protected... Oh, shoot. Get it later. <laughs> um, he protected in San Francisco grew in that respect. But even so, some people are still, some of those places are raided. Uh, the, uh, up in uh, that county up north, what's it called, um, where they grow uh, uh, very good marijuana. Since Mendocino, thank you. It's good that you've read the stuff I've written, honey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they use health, they, they're, they're, it's really like a violation of the uh, Posse Comitatus law because they're military people and dressed out with, with all, and helicopters zooming down. But they don't shoot people, they burn marijuana plants. They settle down, they spot them over. They're, they're, the federal government is so ambivalent about this. There are people in the federal government who understand that, especially anybody who's had a relative who has used it as a medicine and they've had an opportunity to see for themselves for themselves that this, what's all the fuss about? So um, the fact of the matter is this is an uneasy peace which the federal government sometimes violates in California. But for the most part, it's working. It's e working even better in Colorado, which is probably, uh, there are probably more dispensaries in, in Denver, for example, than in San Francisco at this time. And, uh, pardon? No, that's not Mormon country. That's, uh, that's, uh, Utah. That's Utah, yeah. But at any rate, uh, and it, it, it's growing. So the federal government is getting to look sillier and sillier. We have a new drug czar. Marijuana is not a medicine. It has no medical usefulness. I mean, absolutely. They get into these jobs and they're, they're absolutely fixed to the policy. And the people who are appointed, drug czar or head of the DEA, they know nothing about marijuana. You remember that guy who was the uh, White House drug czar, uh, General McCaffrey? Hmm. Now, 
General McCaffrey knew about, uh, about as much about marijuana as I know about the deployment of M1 Abrams tanks. But of course, he was now the drug czar, so he knew everything. In fact, when Proposition 215 was passed in 1996 in California, uh, that's the proposition that made it legally available to patients who had a, a note that could be turned, sent to the state and they'd send you a card for a fee. And then you could go into one of these dispensaries and buy. And he said uh, publicly, he went out to California and he said, any doctors who write those notes a lot, they are going to lose their licenses. He didn't mean their medical, he meant their DEA license, which you can't practice without, because you can't prescribe any scheduled substance. Uh, and in psychiatry, most of the things are scheduled. Um, so uh, McNeil Lara asked him to be on the show with me. And he said, no, I won't be on with Grinspoon. <laughs> I mean, I sh surely, uh, I'm sure uh, he was concerned that uh, such a confrontation might expose how ignorant he was about this, that he was just so what McNeil Lara found a solution. They put him on for eight minutes, and I followed for eight minutes, but we had no chance to interact because I, was, I didn't go to California. And I said, in Boston, they filmed it from GBH. Uh, but does that answer your question? I sometimes get off on these questions. I can't remember whether I really <laughs> I circle around. Well, you see, I think it touches on the demonization because if you ask people who are adamantly opposed to any use of marijuana, they will say, well, look what those hippies, you know, those people with all the hair and the, and, uh, the, uh, <laughs> everything uh, that characterize these people. That's, that's what marijuana does. Yeah. You know, a, uh, one of my leading uh, antagonists in the 70s, after my book came, it was a fellow by the name of, uh, Gabriel Nahas, he was a professor at Columbia, and he was from Cairo originally. And he was adamantly opposed. We were at loggerheads before Senate committees, all sorts of television and everything. Uh, and uh, in reading the book, which I reviewed for the New England Journal of Medicine, a review which Nahas sued the New England Journal of Medicine for a try do for a million dollars and me for a million dollars because in the review I said it wasn't so much a treatise on the psychopharmacology of marijuana but a uh, McCarthy, psychopharmacological McCarthyist McCarthy tract. <laughs> and that was the sentence for which I was going to be sued. Um, but um, the... Uh, Things have changed a lot now, and part of the reason is, you know, just like I think, homo uh, um, I, I think uh, uh, homophobia has been much reduced, as I see it, I'm older than I think everybody in this room, uh, because uh, people started to come out in the 60s with, that I am a homosexual, and people could see they didn't have horns, they, they didn't just laze around and whatever. They were hard-working people like the rest of us. The same is true with marijuana. I mean, and the thing that has particularly changed the image is medical marijuana. Because, uh, I'll, give, I'll give you a for instance. There was a, an associate dean at the Harvard Medical School who was in charge of all Harvard's publications. I was the editor of the Harvard Mental Health Letter, and so I was part of that group that met with him. One day he asked me to stay for a minute. He, wanted to, he told me the story briefly. He lived in Wabin, outside of Boston, but his mother-in-law, who was 67 years old at that time, lived in Miami, somewhere in Florida, I shouldn't say that. And uh, she had pancreatic cancer, he told me. Now, you can't do much about pancreatic cancer, really. The only thing you can do is to make the patient as comfortable as possible because, generally speaking, he isn't going to have a whole lot of time. So he told me, and, you know, there's nothing we can do about that. And the trouble is she's doing fine, except she has nausea. She has constant nausea. 
Now he had, this was just after the first edition of Marijuana the Forbidden Medicine came out in 1993. And uh, he said, I looked at your new book and uh, you talk about its usefulness in the treatment of, of, uh, of nausea and vomiting. Would, it, would Marinol, this is in synthetic, would Marinol be useful? And I said, well, look, uh, Steve, I, it would, but it wouldn't be nearly as useful as it would be if she smoked marijuana. Well, why is that? It's the same, well, you know, he's not, it's the same. And I told him, we don't understand why, but we believe that isolated THC is not as useful as the whole plant because there must be some synergy between tetrahydrocannabinol and other cannabinoids like cannabinol or cannabidiol and maybe the flavonoids that are in the, uh, in the, whatever it is, it's more effective. I've never had a patient or heard from a patient who has had the opportunity, whatever, whether he's treating his Crohn's disease or epilepsy, who has had the opportunity to use both herbal marijuana and marinol, who hasn't said, oh, herbal marijuana hands down. Why do so many people, and I, like a fool, I sold my shares in Unimed, the company, when I was writing this book because I told Betsy, this will be a conflict of interest, I'm sure. This, so I, 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 and it turns out it's not nearly as good as herbal marijuana. Um, and, you know, well, they, why do most people, why do people use, uh, uh, why do they insist on smoked marijuana? Well, first of all, it's illegal. How are they going to, it means they must be pretty motivated to use it. They can get in trouble. Um, the, uh, secondly, they, uh, they understand that, uh, that um, you can't, it's now clear, you know, one of the bugaboos, one of the myths, it will cause lung cancer. Absolutely zip. Uh, the latest, uh, and, and the government even relies, uh, doesn't say that anymore because of this man Tashkin at the University of California who did the definitive study. There's no way you can say that it causes either lung cancer or emphysema. Now, smoking it may cause a slight bronchitis. That's an irritation of the brain. It's not a serious thing. It's just a nuisance because you cough. Anybody who, you know, the heavy smokers like my dad, <coughs> he was always coughing, uh, uh, will be familiar with it. But even there nowadays, you can't even say it will do that because we now live in the day of the vaporizer. You can smoke marijuana through a vaporizer. And it keeps, you know, usually if you breathe through a flame, the, the temperature will go down, but the vaporizer keeps it right in that window. And then you tick, pull out the cartridge where you put the little bit of cannabis before, there's no, it hasn't been burned. There are no ashes. It's changed color from a slight olive to a light brown, but it's not burned. And indeed, it's much more, uh, I shouldn't say lung friendly, because smoke marijuana is not, a problem, but, but trachea and bronchial f friendly. So even that, and many people are now using vaporizers because after all, we live in a non-smoking culture now, thank goodness. And, uh, um, you know, they don't want to, one thing about the vaporizer is it's big, you know, you can't put it in your pocket and go somewhere. <laughs> can we take another question? Or does someone have? Yeah. Well, you can bet your life they are because this, I, I have a list of the, the symptoms and syndromes for which it is now believed to be useful. And it's going to really bump head, head on with the pharmaceutical companies. They stand to lose a lot. You know, when I was talking about this about 20, 30 years ago for uh, Gatewood Galbraith, who was running, uh, who was running f was going to run for governor, had run the fast, and he said, well, Lester, can I say to people that if marijuana is legalized and people can use it as a medicine if they wish, it will cut the cost of medicines down? And I said, no, no, it won't, won't be that. Well, now, you know, I tried to get him on the phone because he's running for governor again. I wanted to tell him you can say that because it's absolutely true. It's going to cost the, cut the cost of pharmaceuticals, of 
drugs, <laughs> including cannabis, it's going to co cut the cost dramatically. Someone else? There are about 16 million Americans who use it at least once a week now. 80 million Americans have used it at one time or another. And uh, it's, it's still used by people. It isn't quite the same level, you know. I, I went into liquor, this is not a very <laughs> uh, well-designed experiment, but I was curious. Uh, you know, all these kids in Harvard Square were smoking dope really right out in the square and so forth. And I went into a couple of liquor stores there and subtly brought this up. And they hate it because it's really cutting off their sales. So, um, and it's not that people don't use marijuana and beer or, or wine or what have you. But, uh, no, there's a very lively interest. Remember, it's not just recreation. It's medicine. And there are many people who will be using it as a medicine. Uh, it is remarkably use. It's as remarkable in its usefulness, in its versatility, as it is in its lack of toxicity. Uh, so there's no question. And then the third thing is, uh, and the thing I've devoted a website to now, because if I ever get to it, I'll do a book on this: marijuana as an enhancer of personal experiences. Whether you're Allen Ginsberg, who is having trouble, as he put, seeing. Cezanne. He would go to the Museum of Modern Art and everybody else talked about it. He couldn't quite get it. So, and he wrote this up in the Atlantic Monthly, I believe it was, in somewhere between 67 and 69. So he got himself stoned, went off to the MoMA. Uh, and he writes about what he saw in Cezanne for the first time. And it's very convincing. And he also says it sticks to the chest. He's had no... Cezanne has been one of his artists since that time. So, uh, What about your friend Carl Sagan, the world-famous astronomer? Carl Sagan, uh, he was the best friend I was talking about. Um, he used it every day. Now, you know, when people say, oh, people use marijuana, get lazy. Let me tell you, I have never known a man who worked harder than Carl Sagan. Uh, and we'd be just having a I'd discuss, you know, talking, and uh, he'd take out an envelope and, <laughs> and jot down an idea. And I remember for one of his books, I went into it, he had a pile of, of, of typewritten with one of these or two of these ideas on it, this high, and he was going to go through them to sort them out for this, which chapter of this book. So he used it. Uh, he was the one who tried to tell me that I was uh, blowing in the wind <laughs> when I told him it was, and he was right. Uh, yes, he used it, and if you want to read a wonderful essay that he wrote for my book, Marijuana Reconsidered. I had to disguise his, he was so well known even then, his age and his profession. <laughs> and we called him Mr. X uh, because it was very important, you know, at that time. Uh, you know, I, I, I've been open about it right along, but I could afford to be because uh, I wasn't testifying before NASA committees and so forth. And if, but if you want to read a nice essay, Read Mr. X in this collection of essays on the web. I have two websites. One is marijuana-uses, not users, but uses, dot com. And you'll see the first essay is by me. You'll recognize the one Mr. X by saying, and you'll rec recognize the one by Allen Ginsberg. But most of the people who wrote these, they're nobody you'd ever he heard of, but they talk about what this has done. I made it for people who had a, an enhancing, enhancing or a disenhancing, and I only got one of the latter. Uh, so I, it wasn't a great essay, but it's the only one I had to represent that. So I put it up. Is that it? Do you feel like you've paid a, a personal price for your scientific endeavors? Well, I have in terms of academic uh, uh, stuff. But, uh, you know, I am so glad I made that choice because, frankly, it's enhanced my life greatly. And uh, I think that I particularly tried to get the, uh, the uh, AARP interested in this, because I think that as people get older, it becomes more useful. But well, I don't mean, whoops, I don't mean to be. <laughs> I'd like to see how you make out with AARP, because they take 
pharmaceutical ads in their publication, so they don't want to lose I wrote a paper. They asked me to write a paper. I did. And it, this was years ago, and it came back so... I'd never seen a paper mine edited like this. <laughs> and I said, this is unacceptable. I withdraw it. I mean, they, he said, take it or leave it. I said, I leave it. <laughs> I will take it back. With potency, uh, you mentioned this a little bit earlier, that there are varying degrees of potency depending on uh, what type of plant it is, where it's grown, and what, what type of substances uh, were used to nourish it. Are you optimistic that there will be some type of uh, standardization later on down the line as the use of medical marijuana I hope continues not. to grow? I hope not. See, okay. I'll tell you why. Um, marijuana, cannabis sativa, is a remarkably plastic plant. Mm. Uh, that is, the, the growers who are, who are cross-breeding them and getting new strains um, uh, have come up with some marvelous strains that were never even heard of before. Uh, and so, and this is all for recreational use. Now, in medicine, this, the recreational stuff does as a medicine too, but a lot of people don't like the high. I think that is something uh, they're missing if they can't get comfortable with that because I think partly it's a great antidepressant and people suffering from the kinds of things they are, this, this will be helpful. But the growers, both in the Netherlands, British Columbia, and particularly Northern California, they were racing to get the THC level up. I mean, the THC is the stuff that makes you high. Or one of the, it's the, it's the primary uh, psychoactive. At the expense of one of the other cannabinoids, one called cannabidiol, or CBD. Now, the newest thing in, in medical marijuana is that it's become evident that cannabidiol is very useful for several reasons. One, it covers the whole spectrum of things that are treated by, you know, just mm -hmm. high-potency marijuana, but it does not lead to a high. It's non-psychoactive. In fact, it's a little bit, it's a little antagonistic to the high. So people, for example, people who have to go to work, like this Robert Randall, he had to smoke it eight times a day to keep his intraocular pressure down. And I said, well, how do you go? And he said, well, it's true. If you smoke that much, you don't get a high. You might just as well not be smoking it if, if your object is to get a high. But it doesn't, there is no tolerance to the medicinal effect. They have a choice. You don't have to have the high, but if, if you like it, terrific. But if you have to go to work and it gets in the way or whatever it is, you can take CBD high. And right now, there is a race all over the world to, you see what happened as the grower's got the THC up high. It used to be three, four, maybe if you're lucky in the 60s, 5%. <laughs> But now it's way up. In fact, there was a strain that was yeah. recently named after me. <laughs> Did oh, you know this? No, I didn't. Uh, Is it, it available? <laughs> <laughs> I've not had a chance to try it because it's, it's, uh, it's, it has a THC level of 25%. That's pretty high. That's pretty high. Yeah. And it also takes longer to grow. It's, it's very expensive over in Amsterdam. But, mm. uh, but the point is, so they did this, but the cannabidiol shrank almost out of existence in these strains. So now, these people are working feverishly to get the CBD up and now have a, a new strain called Maribel, which um, should be available on the market in a couple of months. Uh, and it has virtually, well, so little THC that you can take it and you might just as well have taken it. Well, pharmaceutical one. companies have Mar Marinol, yeah, and now we have Maribel. Yeah. Where's this going? Dr. Grinspoon, the Friends of the Library, would like to present the Certificate of Appreciation to you for appearing here tonight. And uh, we've enjoyed it very much. Well, thank you. I am honored. Thank you. Yeah. Now, if you're interested in this book, our board wasn't able to, to get them for us, but we have two copies uh, up here that uh, Dr. Grinspoon gave to the Friends, which we will... Uh, give to the library in, in June in our annual meeting. But if you'd like to uh, order the books, you can do it on Amazon.com.